this 65 meter high mountain of rubbish in India symbolizes a rapidly expanding global problem. What should countries do with their garbage and how can they reduce the amount they produce every year? This is Inside Story. Hello, I'm Nastasia Tay. It's become a problem of global proportions. According to the World Bank, around 2 billion tonnes of waste is produced every year. And world leaders are struggling to figure out what to do with it all. Should it be buried, recycled or shipped off to another country? We begin our look at the options in East Delhi, India, where they're fighting to contain a 65 metre high mountain of rubbish that gets larger every year. Elizabeth Puranam reports. A mountain of waste. This is where 2,000 tons of East Delhi's rubbish is dumped every day. People living around the site say it's affecting their lives. As you can see, the smell here is unbearable. If the wind blows towards us, then it's difficult to eat food at home. It is such a mess here. The rubbish dump doesn't just smell bad. It's also dangerous. Methane gas from the waste sparks fires, releasing toxic fumes. Ghazipur began as a landfill in 1984, but reached its capacity nearly 20 years ago. Like an engineered landfill. It means that you have a big uh, a hole which is dug out and then it is lined with non-permeable layers so that your toxic leachate of chemicals which comes out from garbage does not leak into the soil and cause water pollution. But in Ghazipur, there's no such thing. Trucks continue to dump rubbish here despite Delhi's governor banning them after a part of the hill collapsed two years ago, killing two people. This is a cruel joke. This is contempt of court. The people responsible continue to dump garbage in this site. They haven't stopped for a day after the court order. We asked the East Delhi Municipal Corporation why this is happening. But because of the no alternative land was available with us, so we continue to uh, dispose of our garbage at this landfill site. It's estimated Delhi produces 14,500 tonnes of waste every day. The problem of waste isn't confined to the city's rubbish dumps, though. Around 3,000 tonnes, or a fifth of the rubbish produced daily, isn't collected, leaving it lying on the streets and other open spaces. Jay Prakash Chaudhary manages this recycling centre and says waste isn't just the government's responsibility. We feel that waste segregation should begin at home. If people start segregating waste, then waste can be recycled properly. And the direct consequence will be that garbage mountains like the one at Ghazipur won't be necessary at all. The East Delhi Municipal Corporation has started testing a recycling program in three areas this year. They hope to roll it out to the rest of the region within one year. They also say they'll start clearing Ghazipur in September and some of its waste will be used to build a national highway. Elizabeth Puranam, Al Jazeera, East Delhi. Well, let's bring in our guests now. In New Delhi, we have Arunaba Ghosh. He is the CEO of the Council on Energy, Environment and Water. In Oxford, we have Sharon George. She's a lecturer at Keele University who specializes in green technology. And in Hong Kong, via Skype, we have Chi Ye. He is the director of the Institute of Public Policy at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Welcome to you all. Let me start with you, Arunabha. Um, what we've just seen there in Liz's report, how widespread is the lack of waste processing in India? And what are the biggest challenges that the government faces in trying to address it? India is one of the fastest urbanizing countries in the world. Um, just its urban population would be the world's third largest country by population. So against this kind of massive push of people to the cities, there is certainly a major challenge of managing solid waste. Uh, and most of the waste in our cities don't, uh, doesn't get processed. Uh, so what that does is it, it, it has an impact on the local environment in terms of the landfill and the methane emissions, etc., It also has an impact in terms of uh, the lost economic opportunity that we could get if we decided to use waste as a resource rather than only something to throw away. 
Well, Arunabha, what we're seeing in India is, is a global problem. So let's also take a look at some of the global figures. Now, the World Bank says around 270 million tonnes of waste is recycled every year. And recycling is now estimated to be a $200 billion industry. Now, it was China that once led the global recycling trade, but it said it banned waste imports just under two years ago because of the threat to the environment. Since then, other countries such as Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia and Turkey had been taking in that rubbish. Um, but they're now concerned they could become dumping grounds for rich countries. Thailand is imposing a ban by 2021, and the Malaysians are also cracking down on garbage imports. So with all that said, um, Professor Chi in Hong Kong, let me ask you about that Chinese ban, because they said it was about environmental reasons. Um, how much of this is about the environment versus politics and economics? Uh, I don't know why people think it has to do with politics at all. If it is, it is a green politics. It's a great, it's a great politics to play. Uh, the, uh, uh, I think the, the reason that uh, China decided to ban the, uh, this uh, garbage import from other countries uh, is totally due to these environmental concerns. Each, every year, that the, by processing this waste, much of that are uh, toxic and waste. And a lot of people get uh, sick, and many of them are children. And also, by processing the, uh, this waste, and it takes a lot of energy and releases a great amount of greenhouse gases that also get accounted as a contribution of China to the global climate change. The, uh, so th this is, uh, uh, you know, considering all these problems, environmental problems, the uh, climate change problems, uh, public health problems, I think the Chinese government finally, finally uh, decided to do the right thing, which is to ban this garbage import from other countries. Well, we're hearing about the toxicity of all of this. So, Sharon, let me ask you, a lot of the waste that's being shipped is ostensibly to be recycled, right? So, um, but not all waste can be recycled. Like low-grade plastics, for instance, can't be recycled. What's the proportion of waste that can't be recycled or disposed of safely? Well, I think we're just discovering now that what we thought was being recycled and what we thought was recycled is... is a lot less than we thought because what technically is a different question between the proportion that is able to be recycled and that that is actually able to be recycled because it's not just about whether it can technically be recycled it's whether it is and whether those facilities are in place so a lot of our packaging in the west is is technically recyclable but actually it's very expensive to do that and the, the, the part of the problem is that we've been exporting poor quality waste exacerbating these problems that we've just been talking about and, and basically exporting our problem without dealing with it ourselves. And so Sharon you were telling me about this the poor waste that's being exported. And because of that, there is this developing political dynamic as well. And, and I want to pay you a couple of sound bites from world leaders who've been pushing back against that waste trade. We will declare war. We will load the containers on a ship and tell Canada that your garbage is on the way. Prepare a grand reception. Eat it if you want to. You're producing too much waste and you have problem trying to get rid of the waste. Landfills and all that doesn't serve any purpose anymore. You cannot burn the waste because of the, the smoke and all the other pollution, pollutants. So you, it is grossly unfair for rich countries to send their waste to poor countries simply because the poor countries have no choice. Uh, maybe it uh, contributes a little to their economy. So there's some pretty strong rhetoric that we're hearing there, both from President Duterte of the Philippines and Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad from Malaysia. Um, Arunabha, I want to ask you, even though we're hearing this strong rhetoric, there is an economic incentive, as Mahathir Mohamad there just acknowledged, for this waste trade. So why are we seeing this pushback now? I think the pushback is happening for two reasons. One is that, um, as one of the other panelists was also saying, what is potentially recyclable does not always get recycled. So the economic uh, opportunity uh, on paper might not always be converting in practice. Um, 
The second reason is that you have to still establish a, a massive supply chain of waste segregation, waste processing, recycling, then reusing in products, which can then again be exported out. Unless that is there, uh, and you keep increasing the amount of waste that keeps coming in from other countries, there is going to be likely a pushback. On top of all of that, there is what I was saying earlier. There is the internal pressures of increasing urbanization, not just in a country like India, but all emerging economies, whether in Africa, whether in Asia, uh, which have to deal with their own waste. So I think it is important to understand that it, if we just limit this to it's not my problem, as long as, as long as I can just transfer it somewhere else, that will not solve this either at a global level or even at a national or a city level within our countries. We have to remove the ick factor from waste and begin the recycling, the segregation, the processing at home. That's where the supply chain has to begin. Arunabha, I, I want to ask you a follow-up on that, because if waste is processed differently, it's, it's not just an environmental or health issue, but there are people who earn their livelihoods, who feed themselves um, because of the money they, wait, they, they make from um, picking through trash. And I believe in India, it's, it's less than a percent of the population, 0.1 percent, but that's still more than a million people. So what happens to the people who are waste pickers and live off the waste, what happens to them and their livelihoods if waste is processed differently? I think uh, there have been actually a lot of initiatives even within India, um, not pan country, but uh, in several cities, where the same uh, so-called rag pickers who were actually going through the garbage dumps with their bare hands uh, are actually being retrained into as, as kind of the, the, the workers who would work in proper recycling, segregation, sorting facilities. So as soon as you think of this as an either or, either you let them continue as they are, leading these nasty, brutish and short lives, or you uh, do waste segregation and recycling in a modern form, that either or will not obviously uh, create the right political and economic incentives at the community level. We've got to take the same communities either give them alternative uh, livelihood opportunities or retrain and reskill them. And that's what is happening in cities, uh, in, in several cities across India. Of course, this has to be scaled up. This is what I meant earlier as well, that we need to remove that ick factor. We can't only treat this as someone else is going to treat my waste, which means that at a community level, we need to reestablish a social mm -hmm. contract between the waste processors the communities, the residents, and the state. Once, unless the social contract emerges, this will always feel like someone else is literally dumping their rubbish on us. So with things potentially changing a little bit in India, let me ask you, Professor Chi, about what's happening in China. So China used to take something like 70% of the world's waste, and now it's dealing with its own waste. 67 million tons of domestic trash every year. What's it doing with its own rubbish now? Is anything actually changing there since this ban was imposed in 2018? Yeah, let, let me just uh, go back to the point you just raised about the economic case. I think there is an economic case for the exporter of trash from the rich countries because by exporting the, uh, this low-quality uh, waste, you can actually save a lot of money to uh, process this waste. On the developing, the poor country side, the economic case can hardly be made. Uh, of course, you know, we can talk about the livelihood. And uh, I mean, you just remind me, the, uh, I live here in Hong Kong, 180, roughly 180 years ago, there was a war on opium. And you can say there is economic case for opium trade from the British, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, companies to uh, China. Then, uh, but that economic case is just economics without morality. So I think uh, that's pretty much the same uh, same case we're talking about here with the waste. And now China is taking this waste issue very seriously. And China has just released the, uh, the national regulation and the national strategy to develop a, a so-called waste-free society and started in two dozens of cities for pilot cities for this waste management. 
Republican here uh, recently in cities like Shanghai and Beijing mm -hmm. sorting this uh, garbage uh, household level has becoming a real big thing. So starting with uh, dealing with the household level and the personal level and uh, the awareness of this uh, waste management has been uh, higher than ever. And uh, in every city and to develop the facilities to process the waste and not just, you know, dumping and burying that landfill and but also in uh, to process in the deeper uh, levels. So I think the, uh, as you just mentioned, China is also developing the whole industry by investing into waste management, waste processing. So that the, uh, but the, uh, you can also hear, you know, from time to time and in places and people are, you know, protesting against the, uh, the waste uh, facilities here in China. I think from the government, uh, the business and the civil society levels, you can hear this uh, uh, really a big campaign on uh, waste management is, uh, is developing real quickly. I, I want to bring Sharon in here because we're hearing about potentially things changing in, in China and India, these developing countries. But now that developed countries are struggling to find places to ship their rubbish to, what are they doing with it all, Sharon? And, and what are their options? Well, at the moment, um, I think that, especially in the UK, we're kind of reeling from the realisation that the destination that we're, where we thought our waste was going is... Ha it, our waste just wasn't going where we thought, and, and we're finding, you know, these shocking statistics about finding waste dumped um, and dumped into the environment where people have been separating their waste in households and thinking they're doing the right thing. So that has a negative impact on people's behaviours. So in the UK, we've kind of trying to deal with, with tightening up um, the whole waste supply chain and making sure that there's due diligence in place to make sure that, that things are disposed of properly. But we're also looking at solutions on our own soil. So right now, waste to energy has become a big thing. So a lot of our waste is, um, more waste is going to incineration to produce electricity. So the calories from things like plastic are being used in incineration. So those things that are not so easily recycled and those lower value plastics are going straight to incineration to produce electricity for homes. And of course, there's technologies such as um, anaerobic digestion that produce biogas to, to reprocess waste food are also becoming um, popular and, and rising in importance in the UK. Sharon, let me ask you there a little more about this idea of burning the waste, because there are health concerns about that um, in terms of the toxicity of the gases that come out, the emissions that we, we see from it. And I mean, some argue, um, Greenpeace for one, that it's really just kicking the can down the road um, and that also basically building incinerators creates a market for single use plastics, which is surely um, goes against the whole point of it. Of course, this is this is the counter argument. It's a very valid point. You know, there's the argument that the plastics are replacing fossil fuels, but actually, if those plastics were reused, if those plastics were not single use, and 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 it, the, that is quite right, that those those incinerators are going to be looking for the calories, so they'll be seeking out waste with high calorific value and high plastics. So it, that that. That is a problem, and the I mean, an incinerator that's run properly should be low in emissions. And the argument is that a po you know the the other the other scenario of having these plastics end up in the environment is down the road a health issue as these things turn into more and more microplastics and potentially end up in the food chain. Of course, the answer to this is is just don't produce so much waste in, in the first place. And we are aware in the UK that we're just producing too much waste. Professor Chi in Hong Kong, I want to ask you, I, I see you, you've been listening to Sharon and, and are keen to jump in there. But what is China doing differently? You, you've talked about um, different waste management systems. Um, what can the rest of the world learn from what China's doing? Yeah, I was going to say Sharon was exactly right. The uh, China also faces this problem in incineration. And like I mentioned, you know, in some places when incinerators are built, 
then you can, from, from time to time, you can hear about the, the protests. Not in my backyard, the NIMBY, the so-called NIMBY behavior here in China, too. So therefore, the, the first thing it, it, to deal with the waste is to reduce the amount of waste generation every day at all levels. Then, you know, from there, we go from reduce to reuse to recycle. And uh, China actually, uh, in uh, just about 10 years ago, led, uh, made the legislation about the circular economy, promoting for the, the circular economy. And uh, now China is taking this very seriously, as I mentioned, the uh, green financing, investment, lending, uh, the businesses in, in this area is, is really booming. So this is becoming an uh, uh, emerging uh, industry for uh, the circular economy. I think that's, uh, that, that, that's a very, very important development. You see a lot of uh, uh, industrial parks are now just uh, uh, redesigning and uh, uh, just putting together this uh, uh, waste and a waste management you know, mm -hmm. by cert certain companies. I think that, that that's one thing. But also, I, I mentioned this, uh, the so-called zero waste movement or zero waste mm -hmm. strategy. And that is happening in about the 2000s of cities. And these cities are now doing the pilot. They're trying to do the experiment. They're trying to come up with uh, some good practices and policy that can be scaled up mm -hmm. at the national level. So. Uh, so this, this year, uh, I think it just is starting this uh, this whole uh, campaign in dealing with the waste. Yeah. Arunabha, I want to ask you as well, just coming off what Professor Chi was saying there, this whole idea about um, zero waste. We've seen various different developing countries, especially some in Africa, actually. I believe now 34 African countries have banned plastic bags. Tanzania was the last one in May. Um, if the world's poorest region can do this, um, What's stopping the developed world from doing the same? I think it's uh, directly linked to our lifestyles. Uh, if we are not, if, if we are not used to going to a shopping market, uh, shopping uh, market and picking up a piece of fruit and putting it in a bag rather than wrapping it in plastic and then weighing it and then leaving, we would just not know that there is an alternative way of going about this. Mm -hmm. Which is why I, I fully agree with Professor Shu that it's it's not just reduce reuse and recycle, I would add one more level to this, which is reduce, reuse, recycle, life cycle. Unless we see from where something is coming and where it'll end up and how we take it back to the source and keep reusing it several times over, uh, we're, 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 even, the, even the recycling operations will fall short otherwise of the amount of waste we'll keep generating. Um, the resource footprint of uh, the, the United States, for instance, is double that of India, even with one-fourth the number of people. Uh, so if you don't change your lifestyles, if you don't look at the life cycle of every product that you're using, you are going to be in this problem. Um, so we have to, of course, create uh, a, an economic case for a circular economy, and that uh, China is demonstrating it. India's leading um, government agency from a, uh, that advises the government, the Niti Aayog, has also proposed to build up a major uh, push for circular economy. But all of this comes after we change the lifestyles in, in the first place. Indeed, and, and trying to find the political will to encourage people to do so. Huge challenges, and it's all about awareness, I guess, going ahead and watching the developing world actually take the lead for a change. Well, thank you to all our guests, Arunabha Ghosh, Sharon George, and Professor Chi Ye in Hong Kong. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Nastasia Tay, and the whole team here, bye for now. <laughs>